Okay, thank you very much. So we've heard a lot of very interesting research in terms of measuring the scale of climate change, the causes of climate change, and so on and so forth. And so now I'm gonna talk about the politics of this and how machine learning can push the literature forward. So in case you need convincing of why understanding the politics matters, I'll go for a simplified version of a policy process. So we know there's a problem. Global temperatures are increasing at quite a rapid scale, much higher than historical averages. We have a pretty good sense of what's causing this. So we've identified the cause, which is typically GHG and CO2 emissions. And we also have a pretty good idea of ways to actually use policy to limit this. So one of the key ways of doing this is by pricing carbon. So trying to get individuals to internalize the costs of CO2 emissions and also have firms to internalize these costs. The key issue is, is that we very often elect politicians who have no incentive to do so. And the public necessarily doesn't have an interest or preferences to deal with this. And so we really need to understand what are individuals' incentives and also politicians' incentives to actually use policy to limit climate change. So how is machine learning going to fit in with this? Well, the key way that it's going to fit in is by dealing with the complexity of policy design and then seeing how this complexity feeds into political preferences. So we have multiple design choices, multiple issues, multiple solutions, which in and of themselves are numerous, but then also there may be complex interactions between these when it comes to understanding the political incentives and political feasibility involved. So we need to make inference in high dimensional settings, which as you know, machine learning is pretty robust and very good at doing so. So in this talk, I'm gonna add and discuss about how there is a value added of machine learning in terms of pushing our existing knowledge of the political and social science research on the feasibility of climate policy forward. And to do so, I'm gonna talk about how it can help us understand regional variation within countries in terms of policy preferences and support for carbon taxation. And then also looking at individual heterogeneity. So identifying what features of policy divine resonate most with certain individuals compared to others. So I'm going to do this through the lens of trying to understand policy design in the field of carbon taxation. Okay. And so the way I'm going to illustrate this is by taking some recent research of mine using experimental data on policy design and how this affects individuals' preferences, and then seeing how we can push the results forward using machine learning. So to give a basic idea of what the initial research was doing, effectively it's experimental design in a kind of A-B testing framework. So we're testing multiple design options and seeing which resonate on average most with the public in the United States and in Germany. And so even something as simple as carbon taxation, there's many design features that we need to think about. So first off, what is the price of the tax? How much are we actually taxing carbon? We also have to think about how the revenue is used from this, as this will turn out to be very important politically. Then we have to think, are other countries involved for a global agreement or more regional agreements, or are countries doing this in isolation? We also have to think about how we deal with other countries that don't have a carbon tax, right? Because we don't want to be in the situation that we're outsourcing our emissions, and so border adjustments may be necessary. And finally, for political reasons, we may want to exempt certain domestic firms in order to generate political support. So within this, we have multiple ways we can do this. And in this paper, we were looking at taxes that range from $10 to $70. We looked at various forms of exemptions, various types of countries that we could include or not, and also various usage of revenue and whether you actually include revenue usage at all. Now, we're going beyond A-B testing because we have 31 things here. So we've run out of letters of the traditional alphabet, but 31 is still pretty easy from a statistical perspective. The key issue, however, which becomes important is that there's interactions potentially between these different design features. So I may be more willing to pay a higher pr price in terms of my emissions behavior if I know that the revenue use is gonna be used in a way that either benefits me or benefits society as a whole. Also, I may be less concerned about the need to have these border adjustments when it comes to external competitiveness if other in countries are included in the first place. And so just looking at pairwise comparisons of this, we've already ranked up to about 366 combinations. Again, 366 combinations isn't too bad, but if we introduce regional heterogeneity, for example, looking at US states, 
Well, now we've run up to close to 20,000 things that we're interested in estimating. If we look at individual heterogeneity, so how individuals respond to different features of this, well, even just the simple baseline characteristics of people in terms of age, sex, income, party identification, this already leads up to about 4,000 or so features. So to push things forward, we really need to use machine learning to deal with this high dimensional, large amount of parameters and do this in a robust way that isn't prone to overfitting and just huge uncertainty. So let's first look at geographic heterogeneity. So how policy preferences are distributed amongst US states. Why is this important? Well, one of the frontiers in terms of pushing carbon pricing forward is through the use of state ballot initiatives. So these are local referenda within states that attempt to impose a state level carbon price. And so one of the largest ones of this is ballot initiative 1631, which was in Washington state. However, this failed at the ballot box, but what you also see is that there's clear geographical heterogeneity going on here, right? So it's not that there's a uniform yes, no on this ballot initiative, but geography is very important. And this is even more complicated if we want to move this to the county level, which I'm displaying here. But in the interest of time, I'm going to just focus on the state level for this talk. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to end up using an approach that was basically able to call the Florida election result for Trump when all other conventional polling methods were failing. And so this approach is called Mr. P, or marginal regression with post stratification. But to make this a bit more complex and use machine learning for this, we're actually going to replace the first part of Mr. P, which is the marginal regression, and instead we're going to use um, Bayesian additive regression trees. So how does this fit together? Well, what we're going to do is first come up with a model of individual policy support based off of individual characteristics and the design features and also state level information. And we're going to estimate this model using Bayesian additive regression trees. So the idea here is we really want to maximize our ability to predict individuals' policy support based off of their individual characteristics, but then also based off of state level information. Once we have that in hand, we can combine this with census data about demographics at the state level to post stratify or kind of impute our predictions in terms of the states. So our initial model is able to make very precise predictions in terms of how someone say who is male from the age of 25 to 35 who went to university would support climate policy. And then we take this information from the census data to weight this by how many of these individuals are within a given state. And so this allows us to generate robust regional predictions from individual level data that doesn't even necessarily have to be representative of the state or the population at large in the first place. So in terms of illustrating some results, what I'm going to show you is support for a $50 carbon tax, which is by a lot of people considered the most effective um, carbon tax currently that could be politically feasible. And I'm going to show you how this support varies by state. So first, I'm going to show you how the support varies if we look at no information about revenue usage and no other countries are involved. And if we're in this situation, then what do we get? One state that you have a majority level of support for carbon taxation and one of the most liberal states in the country, which is New York. Now, if we actually add in some revenue usage information in terms of everyone receiving a tax rebate from the carbon tax, then we get a lot more support going on. Okay. So this is still in the context of no other countries, and what it turns out is that these revenue usage um, pieces of information are actually substitutes for a lack of international involvement. So if we simply have other countries included, we recreate a similar style map, even if we have no revenue usage. So revenue usage is an attempt to buy off individuals who are concerned about the lack of international involvement when it comes to climate change policy. Of course, if you combine these two together, then we get a pretty broad map of consensus in favor of carbon taxation within the US with some notable exceptions. So there we're thinking about how the support for carbon taxation and design features vary geographically, but we can also think about this based off of specific individual information about people. And this means that we're going to have to change our optimization goal and our focus a little bit, right? So typically with machine learning methods, we're interested in optimizing our ability to predict an outcome, okay? And that's the ultimate goal. 
What we're going to do instead here is think about optimizing our ability to find treatments or find features of policy design that have the largest effect for certain groups of people. So I want to find a policy design that maximizes support of carbon taxation for Republicans, for example. So this ties in more with existing literature when it comes to tailoring individual treatments based off of people's characteristics. In this case, the treatment is the design of the carbon tax that we want to see in the world. So the way we're going to do this is use generalized random forests, which is going to allow us to actually optimize over this criteria rather than the predictive outcome criteria that we're typically interested in. And so to do so, I'm going to go with a fairly simple set of uh, individual characteristics to illustrate how this can be useful. So we're going to look at people's age, their degree of climate skepticism, which means to what extent they actually believe that climate change is human caused in the first place, their level of education, their income level, which is going to be important because there's dis different distributions of burden based upon income when it comes to dealing with a carbon tax. We're going to look at party identification, and this is where I'll focus the results on, because in the US context, this is a highly polarized issue with Republicans very much against climate policy whereas Democrats very much for this. And then finally, we're going to introduce sex as well. So to start off with, with just simply looking at providing revenue usage information. So this is simply saying, okay, this there is the potential for the revenues generated from a carbon tax to actually be given back to you or invested in some way. What we see is that this has the strongest effect for Republicans and independents. So my outcome variable here is the percentage of support for people within that group, so ranging from zero to 100. So for the case of Republicans and independents, you're getting a 5% shift here. Okay, So people who are predisposed to be actually opposed to climate policy can actually be pushed to quite a degree based off of just giving this revenue usage information. Whereas Democrats who tend to be supportive of this in the first place anyway, this additional information doesn't really shift them much. However, there's a variety of different ways that we can actually use the revenue from carbon taxation. So we can use this to fund renewables, to provide these tax rebates, to provide various other programs such as programs for people who are in industries that would be affected by decarbonization. And so now what we want to do is identify what are the effects of these specific revenue usages again for our specific subgroups. And so what you see here is that there's a lot of variation both across these different revenue usages, but also in terms of the effect for people based on their political identification within these revenue usages. So if we look at something like reducing corporate taxation, here what you find is Democrats are vehemently opposed to this. So you have a negative treatment effect of approximately 20%. So this really cuts into established support of Democrats for dealing with climate change if you're using the revenue for something that goes against their other general redistributive and policy goal preferences. In contrast, giving people money back through the tax system in the form of a tax rebate really resonates again with Republicans. Okay, so we're seeing a 10% increase in support here, which is pretty sizable. And this kind of information in terms of directly paying people off doesn't have as strong of an effect when it, well, it has a statistically insignificant and very small effect when it comes to Democrats and independents. But then there's also areas of convergence. So if we look at funding of renewables, then what we see is that there's a pretty broad consensus across the ideological spectrum when the actual way that the money is being used from a policy is directly tied with what the policy wants to deal with. In this case, limiting climate change, and in this case, funding renewables. So to summarize this. So Hopefully you understand and are convinced that politics is ultimately integral to understanding climate change, both in terms of what policy options are politically feasible from the public and also ultimately who they elect and their policy preferences for dealing with climate change. And the key issue that we're facing in the political sphere and also in the social sphere is that there's a vast array of complexity when it comes to climate change policy in terms of its design features. Okay, so it's not as simple as setting one price and then going from there, but we have to think about how revenue is used, how other countries are involved, so on and so forth. And so ultimately, machine learning can move us forward by providing additional answers by taking account of the fact that these 
increase of complexity when we look at regional and specific individual heterogeneous treatment effects creates a far more complicated statistical model and problem than we typically deal with in terms of experimental or survey research within the social sciences. And so it does so by actually allowing for robust individual and regional heterogeneity to be modeled in this sphere. And it allows for understanding these conditionalities that are really important for both targeting the design of policies, but also getting a sense of the feasibility of policies across geographical areas. So, thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to any questions you have. Hello. Um, thanks for the presentation. It was very interesting. I have one question. I'm sorry if I missed, but where did you get the data or what's this data? Um, so this is data that we commissioned ourselves in terms of a nationally representative survey. Um, so I focus on the US in this case. So this is approximately three and a half thousand respondents um, through online platform within the US. Okay, is this available publicly? Um, so the replication data is available um, on the Science Advances website and also on my Dataverse, so you can access it there. Okay, thank you so much. Hi, it was a great talk, uh, thanks. Um, what is your optimal policy right now? I mean, for the US, what would you suggest? So, I mean, there's two aspects to what we think about optimal here, right? So kind of obviously, if you're thinking about what maximizes support, then this is gonna be the cheapest carbon tax where everyone's involved and there's exemptions for US firms and so on and so forth. So, but if we're thinking more in terms of optimal policies when it comes to facilitating change, that's something that I haven't looked into personally, but I think is something you can easily do with this in terms of ranking these various attributes and their values in terms of policy efficacy, and then calculating, okay, which of these cross the threshold in terms of majority sport. So this is something that future research will look into. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks also. Um, among the treatments that you offer in terms of revenue distribution, um, there's one treatment that's often suggested, which is the climate dividend, yeah. that you have a per capita redistribution of the revenue. Uh, I didn't see that in your slide. Did you also think about it? Because that's, I think, British Columbia is doing that, yeah. and they are quite su relatively successful with that. So um, why not go into that direction? Yeah, so this is the tax rebate that was talked about where you look at the Republicans. So it's effectively a flat value of money. I think in our estimates here, well, actually it depends on the carbon price. So let's say for a $50 carbon price, this would be approximately $600 um, per person. And this would be kind of refunded through the tax rebate system. Yep. Sorry, I uh, super interesting research. And my question was pretty similar to his, is what, how can we use this? Because um, I think this is super powerful. And there's, there's a guy, there was a guy in the news this morning, um, Tobias Brush, professor of psychology in the University of Geneva, okay. that was looking at, he's done like some meta study on why people don't act on climate change. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be really interesting to combine it with your research to find like, what are the, the triggers that can make people actually take action, uh, both on the political level and on the individual. Do you have a comment or? Um, yeah, so this is definitely where I'm pushing this forward now. We're looking more into this individual and regional heterogeneity is the kind of key to this question. Also in particularly in terms of generating some out of sample validation where you can compare once I get to the county level with this model in terms of how the votes for initiatives correspond with the predictions of this model. Um, as a kind of general average statement, if you average over a lot of design features, what you can find is that it's actually politically feasible for a $50 carbon tax as kind of shown with the state um, information to be supported by a majority. Um, but of course, then we have to think about other aspects in the political process that may hinder this, so yeah. 
Yeah, I was particularly interested about the difference between the uh, income tax reduction and the rebate, mm -hmm. um, particularly because even among Republicans who would probably benefit more from the income tax reduction, or at least that's, if I understand mm -hmm. it correctly, a more a less progressive option, mm -hmm. that they supported the rebate more. Do you have any kind of comments about that? So there's kind of two aspects of this. So one aspect is that the rebate is very kind of immediate to people. And of course, while Republicans tend to be a bit richer on average, there's plenty of low-income Republicans as well. And so this very direct dollar amount clearly has a stronger effect in, in this case. Um, more generally, I'm actually also have some research that dives in more to the distributional consequences in terms of individuals' income levels and providing them uh, information about how they would personally be affected. And there you see what happens is that there's actually the real cleavage becomes high-income Democrats who would actually pay a lot more because they tend to consume a lot, but this goes kind of this material aspect goes against their political ideology, and so you actually see them having stronger negative effects. So, yeah. um, I really liked your research. Thank you very much for the presentation. I just had a question about the individual indicators. You looked into the the, part, um, the um, party participation, um, the individual um, participation uh, party. But did you look into the other indicators? Like, did you do sort of ranking of which indicators lead to different changes in the, mm -hmm. in the estimates? Yeah. So in, in terms of this individual characteristics, so I did look into variable importance. And there you see it's party and income that tend to drive this. Mm -hmm. Now, the issue with the variable importance metric that I use is that income has a lot more variation than these kind of discrete character categories of parties. And this actually, I would say biases the importance because any variable you have that has more variation is gonna allow for more splits, so then it's considered more important. Um, but in my own other research, it's less using these, um, this specific generalized random forest, what you find is that these income effects actually tend to be quite important as well. And then also interacted with um, someone's political party. Uh, just to follow up uh, real quick, um, I also am interested in looking at uh, how climate change skepticism mm -hmm. can um, be a, a major factor in uh, one's decisions. How did you see that in your research? Uh, so the long story of my research is climate skepticism doesn't really have much of an effect. Well, how would you call it? Messaging can't affect climate skeptics. Okay, so climate skeptics obviously have very strong policy preferences and it's very hard to move them. So I have some research from 2016 in Nature Climate Change that basically demonstrates that these framing effects don't work. The alternative thing, which is also another paper I have, which should be available on my website, which is under review, is that whether we're actually accurately measuring climate skeptics and whether there's social desirability bias in this case. And what you find is that actually we may be underestimating climate skepticism in the US and Germany quite substantially. Um, but this is a other thing as well, so yeah. So we have time for one more quick question. So am I understanding you correctly um, that the states that you were showing, showing up on the map, that it was sort of a simple majority there? Yeah. Because my understanding of uh, the problem of a sort of enacting climate change legislation is actually that the, the democratic system isn't necessarily all that democratic in yeah. the states, right? And so is there a way for you to, uh, to compensate for that in this modeling? And, and if there is, did you do it? Um, so in terms of looking at simple majority and behind this, 
So the key thing there was the this analogy and this link to the ballot initiatives, right? So so there, if you have simple majorities, that's sufficient to actually be able to enact the policy. Um, of course, once you move beyond these kind of simple referenda, then this kind of idea of representation and whether a simple majority is sufficient to generate enough political movement to enact a policy comes into play. And this is something that I haven't looked at in this case, but is obviously important as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> All right. Let's let's thank Liam again.